I mean, the first gigs, the first gigs we did, we pretty much had to organize them ourselves because there was nowhere to play. Okay. It, was, it was it was slim pickings back then in the yeah. seven, early seventies um, in England. Yeah. But you were um, in a band called Arms and Legs. Well, terrible name. All my all my early bands had terrible names. Terrible names. Um, uh, uh, Arms and Legs was originally called Edward Bear. That was the band that Joe Jackson was in. It was a cover band he had joined when he was like 19 years old okay. because he was going to school, music school in London, and he was broke. So he joined this band to make some money on the weekends. And then the guys that formed the band had been doing it for years and decided to, they wanted to retire or something. Mm -hmm. So Joe was kind of scurrying around trying to replace these guys and keep the thing going because okay. they actually had gigs. And so that's where I came in. So uh, and then then we you know some years went by and we got a record deal, and if you can believe it, <laughs> the record company said you have to change your name because there's already a band with that name. Right, they had a hit, yeah, one hit wonder. We didn't know they were Canadian, I think. Yes, yes, they were. Yeah. N I had no idea, mm -hmm. so uh, we had to change our name. So we ended up our pr our record producer uh, uh, came up with the name Arms and Legs, which we hated, but <laughs> it it was better. It was marginally better than mm -hmm. Edward Edward Bear. <laughs> so, yeah, so we did have a record deal for a minute in like 1975. Um, we made three singles and they all bombed, but the premise was that if one of them was a success, then we could make an album. We'd be allowed to make an album. And of course, they were all dismal failures and uh, we got dropped and that was that. Did you ever hear any of those singles on the radio? Any of those yeah, I think the last one. I think I did hear the last one, was which was called one? Any More Wine, written by Mark Andrews, who was the lead singer. Joe wasn't the lead okay. singer. Um, and, and it actually did get the most radio play out of all of them. But the, the irony is that by the time I heard that on the radio, the band had already broken up. <laughs> it was one of those classic yes. scenarios, you know. So, um, yeah. But, um, but it was interesting because we did get to record at Air Studios in London. Oh. We did one of our, I think that song, Eddie More Wine, was recorded at, at Air Studios. And I remember it was really exciting because we'd never been in a studio like that before. And, um, uh, um, you know, we kept wondering if we would see George Martin or something, you know. And uh, the room down the hall uh, was where Jeff Beck had recorded Blow by Blow. Okay. So we, we sort of looked in there like it was like sort of like a holy shrine, you know, because that was like, you know. Like Jeff Beck was doing that, and we were doing this like poxy little <laughs> pop song. So uh, anyway, but then you, Joe, starts his own band and asks you to be a member, yeah? Well, Joe and I had been at this point friends for some time. Mm -hmm. So uh, Joe left the band in disgust when we got dropped, you know, mm -hmm. and he went off and made some money doing cabaret gigs and this and that, and uh, and writing some songs. Mm -hmm. And we we kept in touch the whole time. So this is by now 1977. Okay. And he, you know, at some point he said, he said, I want to record these demos. So we did them in three batches of four songs each. Okay. And by the time we'd finished, we had 12 demos. And I can remember sitting at home listening to them and thinking, wow, this, this is really good. You know, this could do something, you know. Because I'd already had the thought that after the first debacle that we had our chance and we, we didn't, nothing happened. Yeah. We all went back to our day jobs and... And uh, so all of a sudden I thought, well, this is actually pretty good. And Joe was very, you know, he was very focused, ambitious. Mm -hmm. he, he was going up to London. He was going to play these demos to people. And, uh, you know, in worst case scenario, he was going to put it out himself if he couldn't. So he had a kind of a, a plan. Yeah. Kind of a plan. And uh, then one day the phone rang and Joe said, I got a deal. You can quit your job. Wow. <laughs> Come up to London. We're going to make a record, you know. And, of course, that was like... Yeah, great. You know, in a way, it was no surprise because I thought the stuff was quality. So you 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 envisioned him having hits at least, or at least having a chance at having a. 
That's a good question because I thought, yeah, I thought that material was really good. But I remember before we did those demos, uh, after the first band had broken up, arms and legs had broken up, I remember him saying, yeah, you know, sod that, I'm going to go off on my own and, and you know, I'm going to do my own thing and I hope you would be involved in it, you know. And I remember saying to him, yeah, I'd love to, you know, because I thought he was super talented yeah. and uh, he was really the only legitimate musician I, I knew. Yeah. Everyone else taught themselves like me, but Joe was actually going to music school in London. Right, right. His, in his class was Annie Lennox and Simon Rattle, who's now Sir Simon Rattle. And uh, so, yeah, so that was Joe. So I kind of had a, always had a respect for his talent. However, I remember thinking, well, I don't know about you being the lead singer, you know, because I didn't, you know, he, he had a long way to go with his voice at that point. Um, but he really did work on that. Well, the tide was changing also as punk rock, so we were going back to the three-minute pop song at the time. Right. And, of course, it was more, more style than execution at that point, so... You know. Right, 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 right. Yeah, there were people that had only been playing a few weeks that were in the top ten, you know. <laughs> so, uh, God bless them, you know. There were some good songs, too. They were great songs. You know, yeah. so. Yeah. Now, your bass style actually kind of, I remember the first record, defied convention back then because with regard to the sound, it was very upfront. It, well, that was a production decision, but the know. sound, that was just the sound I was, I was into at the mm -hmm. time. The fact that the, in the mixes they ended up pushing the bass, uh, that was obviously nothing to do with me. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, I'd been using a pick and I'd been using these black flat wound strings. Um, and was that a Fender or wrote as, uh, a Rickenbacker at the time? What no, was it was an Ibanez. It was, it was a knockoff. Okay. They called an Ibanez Silver Series. It was a knockoff of a jazz bass, basically, <laughs> that they made back in the 70s just for a few years. Mm -hmm. And that was the, my only instrument. That was the only instrument I owned. And uh, I was playing through Fender Bass Man 135, which is still one of the best bass rigs I ever owned. Okay. And I uh, wish I still had it. Um, using a pick because I like the sound of the pick. Mm -hmm. and, um, and with the treble up because I like the sound. I don't know, it was just the sound I liked at the time. And so by the time we went into Eden Studios in 1978 and made that record, that was, that was the sound, you mm -hmm. know? So. And of course, a year later, I, I was using my fingers and rolling the treble back because I decided I wanted to sound different, you know. <laughs>